those of you that I have not met, my name is Ed Foley. I have the privilege of holding the Dun Scotus chair here at Catholic Theological Union. As many of you know, the Dun Scotus chair was a gift from the John the Baptist province in 1997. Um, and we have a number of their members here this evening. Would the members of the province uh, from John the Baptist please stand so we can say thank you? There they are. Yeah. This evening is part of a larger symposium. The symposium began to gather this afternoon about four o'clock. There are 40 so uh, folk from six different jurisdictions, uh, Franciscan communities, thinking about the issue of the formation of Franciscan men for mission in the 21st century. As part of that symposium, there are two public uh, events. One of them is this evening with Father Michael Perry. Tomorrow evening, uh, John Corriveau, the former Minister General and recently retired Bishop of uh, Nelson, uh, British Columbia will be uh, leading a um, town hall meeting style reflection on this topic, offering a couple of proposals, looking for some feedback. So this evening, uh, Father Perry is going to give uh, a lecture for us. After that, there is going to be a facilitated response. Uh, we're delighted that Sister Margaret Carney, uh, the President Emeritus of St. Bonaventure University, is with us this evening and throughout the symposium she will be facilitating the response uh, this evening. Um, for introducing um, Father Perry, it's my delight to invite back a, um, a very proud CTU grad, um, former student who is now the provincial of the John the Baptist province. So we're delighted to welcome Father Mark Singer to do the introduction. Mark. <laughs> It's a privilege tonight to be able to introduce someone who's known throughout the Franciscan world as the Minister General for the Order of Friars Minor. Michael Perry was born just a few hours from here by car in Indianapolis, Indiana. He first professed his vows to the disorder in 1978, solemn vows in 1981, and ordained in 1984 same year that he graduated from CTU with a Master of Divinity. Michael uh, was sent and worked as a missionary in the Democratic Republic of Congo in formation and teaching. He earned a doctorate in religious anthropology in Birmingham, England. He has served in the United States as a resource for the U.S. Catholic Conference as well as for Catholic Relief Service. He was elected Provincial Minister of the Sacred Heart Province in 2008, and Sacred Heart is one of the founding provinces of CTU. The following year, he went to General Chapter in Rome and was elected uh, Vicar General of the Order. When the, that Minister General, Father Jose Caballo, was named Archbishop, Michael completed a six-year term only to be elected himself as Minister General by the next General Chapter of 2015. Michael has been a zealous advocate for our Mother Earth, the poor, and those on the margins. In an interview in 2016 with St. Anthony Messenger, just a plug, <laughs> he said, when you have nothing, shameless plug, yes, when you have nothing, when you have no guarantee of tomorrow or the next day for your food, for your lodging, for your health, you're forced to recognize the role and dependence you have on God. For wealthier people to serve our brothers and sisters who are poor, to step even briefly into their shoes, Michael said, is transformative. This is something which I hope for, he said, and something he thinks Franciscans can facilitate. We have a special privilege to invite others to come into these places of grace. When we do that, we and others will never be the same. 
Please help me to welcome Father Michael Perry, Minister General of the Friars Monument. It's a great honor for me to be here to try to share a few thoughts with you tonight in a timely manner. But, uh, Mark, thank you very much. I'm not sure if that was fake news or not, but anyway. <laughs> I'd like to begin with a passage from the Gospel of Mark, the, the first chapter. It happened in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. On coming up, out of the water he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him and a voice came from the heavens you are my beloved son with you i am well pleased and at once the spirit drove him out into the desert and he remained in the desert for 40 days tempted by satan he was among the wild beasts and the he was among the wild beasts and angels ministered to him. After John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. It's a great joy, but also a great challenge to be here before you tonight, as both as minister general, as servant of the Order of Friars Minor, and as a brother among you in the Franciscan movement. I think there are two central things that we have to confront during these days. The first is a central question. What does it mean for us who are religious and by particular extension or by application Franciscan who share charismatic origin under the Franciscan Institutes, under religious who have embraced and consecrated life and the public profession of the evangelical vows, what does it mean to be engaged in a lifelong process of conversion? And even more challenging is what forces of heaven might it be required in order for us to be convinced that we have in fact embarked upon a lifelong formative process and then to set out trying to live this day by day. The answer to the first, some might argue, can be found in all of our wonderful documents, in all of our religious communities, and in Vita Consecrata and other documents. So that question is already resolved. Let's go to the documents, and I've finished most of my talk. <laughs> the answer to the second, perhaps, will require just a bit more time to resolve. What forces of heaven might be required to convince us that this is a lifelong journey? I'd like to reflect for a moment just a couple elements of the Gospel of Mark. First, the Gospel of Mark, a narrative, a gospel narrative, a theological narrative, deals with the initial moments in the life of Jesus, where he moves from a private life in and around Nazareth to a public life that would eventually lead him to Jerusalem, the center of religious and political power, and to his death. I believe that Mark's text offers some clues about the nature of our religious profession and presents us with elements necessary for the lifelong journey upon which those of us who are religious have embarked. We hear immediately Jesus goes out from Nazareth to the River Jordan, where his cousin is conducting some form of ritual purification and an initiation into a new form of life, one involving personal conversion and entry into some new type of community. Jesus goes out in search of something when he goes to John. Is it the spirit that's pushing him? Is it disorder, confusion in his own life about what his future should be, what his mission is? Where does the vocational journey begin in the life of Jesus? And where does it begin in each of our lives? I'd like to suggest that Mark's theological and spiritual understanding of conversion is one that it always has a social or public dimension, not simply a private or individual matter. Through baptism into the way of Jesus, the disciple receives a new identity and must be that identity that must be deepened, that must be developed over a lifetime of decision making, of choosing to place God at the center of all. Discipleship in the community of Mark is about embracing the gift of calling. 
but it's also about undertaking a new way of life. Received as a gift, one that's understood as living together in a community of others who have received the similar gift. Journeying together with the one who accompanies and explains the significance of the gift, Jesus the rabbi. This journeying with Jesus is experienced as an unfolding of a mystery over one's entire life. I believe this is the case. Mark's understanding of Jesus' own life, his own coming to understand his life, the meaning of his life, the meaning of his death, and he applies this to all understandings of discipleship. Here I find some key elements emerging from the first part of Mark's text that are also present, I believe, in the spiritual intuition and the life practice of our founder, St. Francis of Assisi. Francis' own calling begins with promptings of the Holy Spirit. He can ask questions. Was it because of the violence? Was it because of forms that he had some experience, deep experience, psychological troubling that he underwent? Different authors have made this in recent times have made the argument perhaps even possibly that he took someone's life and perhaps he was experiencing some type of trauma following that. Whatever pushed Francis to begin the journey, however it started, for Francis, God is experienced as the first author of his formation, the guide for his understanding of what it meant to be in God, for God, and moving with God. And Francis applied this equally to all the brothers. We know that things began to heat up right away for Francis. Some of the brothers felt pressure. They wanted to have something to help them explain the meaning and the validity of their new way of life. And we know that some sort of short document was prepared and presented to the Pope for some sort of approval. That document no longer exists. What's very interesting though is whatever that those original elements of that document were, that first rule, each year the brothers gathered in chapter, they continued to add to the initial text, reflecting what they were learning on the way in the life. Learning about God, learning about being gifts and gifted in the fraternity, learning about missionary engagement, preaching, social work, and even just manual labor work. That's a theme that came out. In fact, the campus just a couple of years ago did a full plenary council on the concept of work. I hope, I hope it's working for you. I'm afraid if we did one, it might not be as successful as yours. So. In 1220-1221, Francis returns from whatever happened to him in Navietta, and it was life transforming. Some recent focus, and as we lead up to the 800th anniversary, probably will bring some more of that to light. But there was, again, internal and external pressure on Francis to write a rule to explain the new life and to place some conditions on entry to and continuation in the movement. So in 1221, Francis, with some of the brothers, set out to prepare a text that proposed a way of life modeled on the way of the life of Jesus presented in the Gospels. And for any of us, all of us who have read the regular non volata the unapproved rule, probably never submitted for approval to the Pope because of the brothers, that text was meant to inspire the brothers to commit to follow Jesus. Francis did not want his brothers to be guided by a set of rules to which the brothers were to regulate their lives. He wanted them to remain in deep communion with the poor and crucified Lord Jesus, to seek, and for them to seek this, to live this experience of deep communion by living among brothers and sisters who were poor, excluded, exploited, powerless, and landless. So discipleship here really was about, in the Francis' life, was a central theme. It was about walking with the master, being guided by the master Jesus, and allowing the master to lead them wherever the spirit would lead them. The third attempt, 1223, the successful attempt, the regular bulata, provided, that seemed to provide sufficient organization, sufficient structure to the followers of the way of life uh, that they had professed, and was met with approval of the church, providing norms or criteria for guiding the brotherhood. Perhaps the brothers, some might say, were acting in good faith, trying to protect the movement from being quashed by the hierarchy of the church, who sought to root out evangelical movements that were critical of the structures and of others that proposed a way of life that was not 
in accordance with the received tradition, the true faith. Francis complied with the brothers seeking stricter description, a stricter description or rule to govern the movement. And he employed the help of several brothers who had been trained in canon law and the assistance of Cardinal Ugarino. Ugarino. However, Francis would not relent in his conviction that the gospel provided the fundamental vision and means for achieving what God had asked of him and what God was asking of all the brothers. Francis transformed the concept of rule into a way of life, modeled on the life of Jesus, discovered through his personal engagement with the biblical texts and from moments of intense prayer and contemplation and from practicing the way of life that Jesus proposed to his disciples and that he proposed Francis to lead to himself. And this practice of life, this way of life was done with the brothers. For this reason, the document that the, the document of rule that we profess is not a rule, it's a rule and life. And that, that connection between rule and life is never lost to Francis, but sometimes I fear it's lost to us. The rule, what is that? The concept of our first part, the rule, it's grounded in the living experience of Jesus. The way that Jesus carried on his life with God, his understanding of his own discipleship, Jesus, a disciple of the Spirit. The life that Francis speaks about involved the recommitment of Francis and the brothers to seeking the way of conversion and transformation through the quotidian. Just through daily being together, living and walking. The rule in life applies equally, however, to all the brothers those at the beginning of their vocational journey, as well as those in the middle or nearing the end of their journey. For Francis, there was no distinction between the responsibilities for receiving and living the way of the life of the gospel set out in the rule and life between novices and professed members of the order. Francis's conviction was clear, the centrality of living what the buyers profess, the gospel, to be men of prayer, men of mercy and care for each other, Men of eternity, the privileged place where God reveals God's will, a place where Jesus is encountered, a place where the brothers practice together, walking in the footprints. A fraternity open to the poor, living among those who were discarded, exploited, marginalized. A community that was open to mission, which we'll hear about tomorrow, I think, with the following, so think about mission. And as I'm not going to say it because you're here, Margaret, but you already alluded to this earlier. The other thing that was central in the life of Francis was the way of penance. This is not the privations, the physical privations, although there certainly were many of those. His understanding of penance was rather a vision of life, a vision of what God was calling him to become, who God was calling him to become. And that meant that he had to undergo for his entire lifetime metanoia, conversion, coming to perceive the handiwork of God and the divine divinity in all peoples, in self-serving politicians, in the Aristotelian classes, in the poor, in the present in all of creation, and after Damietta, or during Damietta, even present in Amalika Kami, present in Muslims. This progressive conversion process would only take place if the brothers were to come to understand that their vocational journey ran from the moment of their first calling through the day when they would depart from this world and be welcomed to paradise. And there's enough evidence of that in the admonitions and letter to the minister and testament and other places if you have any doubts or consult with the specialists in the room. I'd like to return to the gospel text for just a moment again. Back to Mark. You are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Jesus submitted to the ritual purification and baptism in the waters of the River Jordan, conducted by John the Baptist. Mark does not miss the opportunity, however, to tell us that something amazing happens in the life of Jesus. Whatever awareness he might have had of his identity and mission prior to the event of baptism, who knows? The moment Jesus reemerges from the water, waters of the Jordan, the Spirit of God descends upon him like a dove, and a voice cries out from the heavens, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Jesus receives confirmation of a new identity, one that is given to him as gift from God, and that according to the evangelist, forever changed the course of his life. 
While Jesus took the initial steps to leave Nazareth, to go into the desert in search of John, Jesus, once he gets to the waters of the Jordan, he is no longer in charge. The Spirit of God now assumes the role as the chief protagonist. Perhaps this is something for all of us to, to think about as well. Some of us, it happens, if it happens either beginning, initially, or later, we begin to think that we're in charge of our vocation, that we're in charge of our religious life, as if we could ever manage anything of such level. What Mark's Gospel reminds us, and what Francis tried to remind us, is that vocation begins with God. It's a gift from the beginning until the end. It's followed by an invitation to live in lifelong friendship with Jesus and in partnership with God. I think there's something else that's revealed in this life of Jesus, and, and we'll see it in the life of our great founders, and Francis included. Dominic, Dominic and Friar Timothy Radcliffe, who spoke here several years ago, I believe, but not on this theme, talks about something he calls a narrative unity, that each decision, each action in Jesus' life forms part of a cohesive whole, with each succeeding decision taken by Jesus as a consequence of previous decisions. Radcliffe writes, to have an identity is for the choices that one makes throughout one's life to have a direction, a narrative unity. What I do today makes sense in light of what I did before. My life has a pattern like a good story. Jesus' life has a pattern. It makes sense from beginning to end. This is precisely what the evangelists perceive in the life of Jesus and what they try to communicate to us. Mark also himself is not a, he's not an un, a non-guilty by, bystander. Mark himself follows the same call that Jesus receives to become a disciple of the Father, following Jesus' way. Jesus' life becomes the model par excellence for a lifelong commitment to the conversion of mind, heart, and deeds required of all Christians in the theology of Mark. Come after me, follow me. For there were many who followed him. This following of Jesus, however, will re lead to crises, many crises, and to the cross, but also to resurrection. Jesus is driven into the desert by the Spirit. This I find, frankly, a disturbing text. It's disturbing because it's fundamental and fundamentally perplexing. It says something directly about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus in the community of Christ. Jesus remains for 40 days, undergoes threats to his person, involving conflict, struggle, purification, and coming probably to some eventual peace. I know there have been some wonderful books recently, the last 20 years, 10 years, written about the beauty of the desert. Well, don't fool yourself. The desert's a horrible place. It's a <laughs> difficult place. And if you don't, haven't been there physically, perhaps you've gone through some struggle in your own life, as I have in mine, and the desert is a very lonely, difficult place. Just ask Moses in case you don't believe me. But 40 days, or 40 years, this is a metaphor for talking about a lifelong commitment to follow in the way of the covenant. The Father's first expectation of Jesus is that he embraces his new identity, and the consequences that flow from this, you are my beloved son, I am pleased with you. God at the center of all. Anybody ever been to Gethsemane? Has anyone ever gone to Gethsemane? You go to the guest house, what the two words that you read there, the first two words you see, and the last two as you're reading? God alone. God alone. This was true also in the life of Moses and of the Israelites, at least the biblical text and the theology would like to suggest that. Something else which is very important, I think, in this gospel text of Matthew, of Mark, Jesus is accompanied. He's not alone. Wild animals and the angels serve him. Now there's some debate if you're a scripture scholar here tonight, you can tear my argument apart later. There are two ways of looking at the text, I'm told. One is that Jesus, at the end of the 40 days, the end of his experience, whatever that time was, that the angels and the animals came and they took care of him. But there's another reading of that theology, that the angels, that the animals, wild animals, were present with Jesus from the very beginning. 
I happen to like that second version, so that's the one I'm going to speak to tonight. And I like it because it fits. It makes sense. Discipleship is always an experience of accompaniment. This is something true in the gospel text, particularly in, in the um, understanding of discipleship in Mark, and I think it's also true in our own understanding, at least could be true in our understanding as members of the Franciscan movement. The crisis of the desert prepares Jesus for a lifelong journey that will be marked by more crises than successes. And I think this is something else to keep in mind. This lifelong process that we're involved can be marked more by struggle than by glorious resolution, more by, I would say, things tearing us apart rather than putting us back together again. But we're not alone there. I, I just happen to remember something Nelson Mandela said years ago. He talked about the climbing the mountain, and when he got to the top of the mountain, he was so happy and so relieved until he looked out and saw that it was just the first one of many ahead of him. And so it was just a matter of preparing for the next one, the steel, the glorious pieces that surrounded him. But he says, but I can only rest for a moment because with freedom comes responsibility. Mark's understanding of the life of Jesus as a disciple of the Spirit will be marked by these mountains, crises, and suffering, the result of choosing for God each and every day. And here, I'm not going to say it now, but there's something could be delicate about the idea of redemptive suffering. What is the role of redemptive suffering in the ongoing process of formation for our lives? Does suffering have meaning? And I actually believe that it does. It only has a meaning if we have some idea of a narrative unity, a vision that we are part. We've been called by someone for something. And that narrative unity is offered to us, but it's also constructed by us with God. Perhaps this should be something we should think about for future plans for fraternal life, for mission, all these whatever plans were for formation at whatever stage. In my service as Minister General, I've been struck very often by the difficulties that arise in the lives of the brothers of the order when confronted with adversity. Perhaps it's a sign of the times, but the capacity for brothers to recognize new opportunities for growth through this experience of suffering, self-doubt, disappointment with self and others, falling in and out of love, losing zeal for the evangelical life and for missionary evangelization, the inability to relate in an adult, healthy manner with those who are in service of authority and for those in service of authority to act like adults as well, the inability to share one's life with the brothers in the same community, these all seem to be at times seriously compromised in our lives. Two stories. One, the story of a brother who fell in love and came to meet me, called and had urgently to meet with me, and he flew from another country. He told me that he would be leaving the order as soon as possible, within weeks. I said, well, that's, I mean, I'm gonna pray for you. Can you explain a little bit more? Have you, have you talked to, you talked to your provincial? No. Well, did you talk to the brothers in your fraternity? No. Okay, then did you, who did you talk with? Well, I talked with the woman I'm in love with. I talked with my mother and father and hers. I talked with my cousins and, and, I also spoke with someone else, but I didn't speak with the friars. The friars, I learned later, were surprised that he was leaving until they opened their eyes and realized that he had left already several years before. He was just still living in the house. On another occasion, a brother informed me that after conducting serious discernment regarding his vocation and his future, the serious discernment, he told me, consisted of spending several hours in prayer, talking with his sister, with a close friend and even with a priest he'd never met before, he had decided he could no longer live, tolerate the local guardian and that he would be moving to another fraternity. What's the point of these narratives, these little stories? I think there are two things. To tell us something about what crisis is and about what crisis is not in the long narrative of our lives. Crises are not something experienced only by the individual religious who undergoes them. They are collective. They have an impact on all of the brothers. What one suffers, all suffer. And so the question becomes then, why should we suffer alone? Why do we block 
people out of this process of to trying to understand what the spirit might be doing. And that brings us to the second question, what are the crises? What's the nature of crisis? And I believe, and from reading the scriptures, it's an invitation from God to review our lives, personal and collective, to see in what areas we need further con conversion and growth. Further conversion and growth. Crisis can help strengthen us if they're lived with faith, if they're lived in dialogue and discernment, if they are accompanied by the friars on the religious with whom we share a common vocation. David Brooks, I don't know if anyone has ever heard of him, he's a political commentator, popular speaker, author of a book entitled The Road to Character. And it's a story of different key people that he believes offer something about what is character and how to build that. And he points to one key building block for the construction of human character, the ability to discover in weakness and human struggle and crises the road towards authentic identity. An interview he did uh, about a year after he wrote the book, he says, through history, people have gone back into their own pasts, sometimes to a precious time in their life, to their childhood, and often the mind gravitates to the past, in the past to a moment of shame, something committed, some act of selfishness, a lack of courage. You go into yourself, you find a sin which you've committed over and over again through your life, your signature sin out of which all others emerge and you fight that sin, you wrestle with that sin, and out of the wrestling, that suffering, then a depth of character is constructed. And we're often not taught, he says, to recognize the sin in ourselves, and we're not taught in this culture how to wrestle with it, how to confront it, and how to combat it. Out of that, ref that, that wrestling, that suffering, a deep character is constructed. I'd like to suggest that most critical aspects of the formative process from beginning to end, from posthumously to the end of life, is about creating spaces within our religious fraternities, our communities, where we actually can help one another learn how to confront the truth about ourselves, those areas of life requiring further conversion. Our beautiful formation documents, unfortunately I didn't get a chance to see the draft, uh, the Capuchin, the, the draft is in progress, I tried to get a copy of it, but uh, they were holding it under lock and key, so I couldn't see. But most of our documents speak about the centrality of interpersonal relationship as a tool for conversion, for calling us experts in community. But our efforts seem to be frustrated by a serious lack of sustained attention to and formation for interpersonal fraternal living and for dealing with crises. Perhaps these are undermined by the forces of individualism and perhaps the strong pull that each one has to take care of himself, each one has to manage his own life. And we know what that means in even in terms of whether or not we would commit to a lifelong process of change. The second element, which comes over and over again repeatedly, is the impact, at least for the men, communities of, of Franciscans and others, is clericalism. The attraction of privilege, the concentration of authority and power in the hands of a religious priest that becomes exclusive and excluding. In far too many cases in our religious lives, fraternity, collaboration, and communion are pushed to the margins, leaving the glorified individual at the center. In this same scenario, even God becomes an unwelcome stranger. Conventional Capuchin OFM generals, at the Feast of St. Francis, we had a chance to meet for several days. We talked about the impact of individualism and clericalism on all programs, all levels of formation, as we call this initial and ongoing. The impact it has on discernment, the discernment process, among men coming to join our way of life, and I think certainly it applies to other religious congregations. Too many men join, the, join with the idea of becoming clerics, priests, using Francis, Franciscan religious life as an instrument for attaining the ultimate goal priesthood. I once mused publicly, on several occasions I've mused publicly, maybe we should, it's time for the Minister General of the OFM ask the Pope to suspend all ordinations in the order for five years and give us time to decide what it is that we want to do when we grow up. If we really want to choose this life and what that could mean. Obviously that answer would be no, we know that, the Vatican would never give the Minister General and if, even if I tried, the brothers, some of the brothers would kill me. Um, but even that, 
that still might not be the answer. What will it take to break the shell for us to open our lives up to recognize this as part of our entire lives? In chapters 14 and 15 of the Gospel of Mark, the two texts that deal directly with the suffering of Jesus, who willingly embraces as a consequence of his decisions to remain grounded in God and to live in values of, kingdom, of the kingdom of God, he willingly embraces all that comes. Chapter 14, Jesus has to face the prospect of violent death. Abba, Father, all things are possible. Take this cup away from me. And in chapter 15, we're presented with one of the most troubling of memories, the cry of Jesus from the cross out of desperation, confusion, the sense of being left all alone to face the consequences of his ultimate decision to abandon all for the sake of God's cause, God's dream. Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's nothing glorious about these texts. The cry of Jesus, however, makes sense when it's viewed within the context of all the choices that he's made along each step of his life. The way he's lived and shared his life with disciples, with the friends and other followers, this gospel narrative, this narrative unity emerges. And I would like to suggest the same is true in our founders, in Francis and other founders of religious orders, congregations. They believe that God was the author of the book, the book of life of Jesus, but also their own book of life, and that they were being invited into a lifelong journey to become co-authors with God in shaping the future. I'd like to go back to one more story, and then I'm going to move on what we're doing on time. Are we are okay on time. We're still fine. Okay. I was traveling several months ago in Eastern Europe, and I met one of our older friars, 92, 93, somewhere in that age. And he talked to me about, first one of the brothers introduced me to him, and then he talked to me a little bit about his life. He didn't, at first didn't want to tell me, but he then began slowly to talk about the experience of suffering that he and the other friars had undergone the beginning years when communism was in strong, strong, in strongest, strongest moment, its heyday. He talked about deprivation, food, light, heat. Talked about being harassed by police forces, subject to physical beatings and spending extended periods of time in prison. One would say it's amazing that he survived but frankly, after listening to him, more amazing was the peace that he radiated from his heart. I could feel the peace coming from his heart. He told me that the more difficult crisis he had to face was one of forgiveness and love. That was harder than the physical suffering that he endured. Early on in the experience, he remembers praying for the death of his persecutors, praying for their death out of anger. And at some later stage, he remembers being faced with the situation of one of the very people who had done harm to him in his life and who was experiencing health challenges. He encountered that person in a hospital. He didn't want to do anything to help the person because he, all he could remember was the pain that the person had produced in his, had provoked in his life. And still, he could not reconcile this refusal to help in light of him being a disciple of Jesus and a follower of St. Francis. Even he told me all he could do was reach out and touch and help the human being before him. Talk about someone who recognizes that our Franciscan life is a lifelong journey towards a deeper conversion. In some mysterious way, the violence perpetrated by the communist politicians, police officer, was transformed into a powerful tool for reclaiming the dignity that the abuser tried to rob from the brother. Perhaps this is what St. Paul tried to convey to the Ephesians, where he wrote that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the holy ones what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all understanding. One of the most basic Human, of human needs is to feel welcomed, recognized, part of something greater than oneself, loved, and nurtured in an environment that enables or facilitates growth in all dimensions of life. This also applies to Jesus, who is fully God and fully human. 
in the midst of the desert, as I said earlier, that normally should be devoid of life and companionship, Mark introduces these two sets of characters, the wild animals and the angelic spirits. So perhaps Mark is trying to tell us that this companionship, this time of Jesus and his novitiate, was a time where he was able to experience not being alone, being accompanied. For Mark, as I said earlier, all discipleship is accompaniment. Whatever stages one might wish to speak of in the early community of Mark, the inquiry, catechumenate, illumination, or mystagogy, the pedagogy, or formative experience provided to those who came to Christ was deeply personal and personalized. Its goal was to provide accompaniment to the individual as he or she drew closer to Christ and closer to the community of missionary disciples. It was meant to be life-changing. It was also meant to create within the individual a spiritual docility in which their heart might become more open to Christ speaking in and through his word, in and through personal and shared life events, in and through participation in the sacramental and missionary life of the church. Eden Cavanaugh, writing years ago in a book entitled The Shape of Baptism and the Rights of Christian Initiation, states that the process of the rights of Christian initiation and in whatever form they existed in the early Christian communities spoken of in the Gospels and the other texts from the New Testament and from the early church practice serve as a structure of Christian nurture. I'd like to make a connection now for a moment to this Christian notion of Christian nurture from the RCIA and what it look, might look like in the context of Franciscan life. One essential element for all nurturing of Franciscan life is accompaniment. It's in all of our documents, our recent documents of many of our different congregations' orders. Several years ago, 2014 initially, after a series of years of meeting together, a group of brothers living in different types of intentional communities, mostly in Europe, but not exclusively, living in what were called new forms of for Franciscan life, developed a series of reflections on their experience and how they experienced living more intensely the profession they made. That document is called Ite Nunciates, a short booklet describing these experiences and proposing a series of fundamental qualities necessary for the nurture of living a more authentic, passionate, and joy-filled Franciscan life. They indicate seven elements. First, the primacy of life of prayer and listening, uh, listening attentively to the Word of God individually and in fraternity. I can't tell you how many times I've met with brothers around the world who told me they prayed more and shared more of faith before they came to the Order than since. The second, care and attention to the nurturing of deep fraternal bonds. Third, a simple sober lifestyle witnessing to minority, total dependence on God and interdependence on the brothers of the fraternity. The desire to, desire to enter into the experience and even spiritual proximity living among those who are poor and excluded. The fifth element that the brothers of these intense communities, these intentional communities indicate the fourth element is opening fraternity to welcome all in need, sharing the life of the fraternity with others. The fifth element, participating in the evangelizing, evangel evangelizing mission of the church, interjon gentes, to intimacy, itineracy, simplicity of life, and with a special attention to discovering new frontiers for evangelization, such as interreligious dialogue, intercultural encounter. The sixth element, communion with the local church and collaboration with the laity. And the seventh element, welcome, openness to working closely with members of other branches of the Franciscan family. These seven elements that they articulated did not arise out of reading textbooks. They didn't go to our documents of formation. They came out of reflection of life experience, which suggests that there's a, already a tool, a method for us in terms of thinking about formation, ongoing formation. It's this creating a context for dialogue, for authentic, sincere, sustained dialogue. 
One element, I'm a little critical of, not critical, and I've had many discussions with them, I, I think the one thing that they did not articulate clearly enough, and I believe it needs to be mentioned, and I've added as an eighth element, is a heightened awareness and, com and commitment to issues related to justice, peace, and integrity of creation with special formation in Catholic social teaching. I think Pope Francis makes this imminently clear in Evangelii Gaudium, the fourth part of that, he makes the link between love of God and love of neighbor as one single response of faith. So the process of nurture that's proposed in Ite Nunciatis recognizes that all brothers of the fraternity are responsible for the care and growth of all brothers of the fraternity. There is a role of guardian to be played, to live his life in fidelity, to reach out and accompany brothers. There's a role of formators together with the formation community to reach out and accompany the brothers, sharing the life day by day together. There's a role of all the members of the fraternity, the brothers in what's called initial formation, opening your hearts to be accompanied and to accompany your formators, accompany the guardian, accompany, this is a process about everyone becoming co-responsible. And what's the context for that? What's the context for our living this, deepening this experience of what it means to be life in a long, engaged in a lifelong process? The context for nurturing our Franciscan vocation is daily life. It is that of ordinary life in the local fraternity, inserted into the cultural, social, and political world, as one of our documents, you've been called the freedom, elaborates. Franciscan lifelong formation is experienced in the daily rubbing of shoulders the celebration of liturgical life, contributing to the upkeep of, uh, upkeep of the house, cooking a meal, but don't ask me to cook. Now we'll ask Mario. Attending to a sick person, taking time to listen to the brothers, reaching out to someone who has experienced some type of family or other tragedy, enjoying a beer on occasion, if you like that, or wine or whatever, to share life and to share personal narratives of what God is doing in the lives of each of us these are ways that we shape the ongoing formation process for all of us. So the priority is normal life over the exceptional moments, which are meant to help us return to normal Franciscan daily living out of the gospel. That's the norm for us. The attraction to our way of life, promoting vocations, will come more from that than from anything we can put on the web. We can put all the beautiful stories we want on the web. But when the brothers come and see us, and you've probably heard these stories, each of the provinces of each of the entire family have to pick, cherry pick which houses, which communities they're going to try to introduce potential candidates to because, oh, we can't send them there because, oh, we can't send them there because, you know what I'm talking about. Why, why is that even possible that we can't send brothers to send these candidates to every community? One other thing that's important to think and keep in mind I call it the mind the gap syndrome. If you've ever been to London, you know what I'm talking about. When you get off the, the subway, you have to, it's, it's written there, mind the gap that's between the two. I call it, the, it's the discovering this gap between two moments. It's between the want to haves and the haves. It's between those who have achieved already, they're, they're, they've arrived, and those who are still told they're on the journey. I was once talking to a brother, uh, an older brother, a very, very, very clear, very, very uh, pragmatic. He said, oh, that talk about formation, you know, initial formation, that's fantasy island. Wait till they get to the real life. Well, perhaps a religious of a certain temperament, the real life is a place where little is expected, even less is shared. A place where religious live and die in isolation, loneliness, apathy, and even bitterness. In 2012, the, in order to try to understand what was taking place in some way within the order of Friars Minor, a questionnaire was sent out to 1,500 Friars. 1,419 responded, 93% were aced. Fantastic. More than 40% of the Friars who responded said that their lives had become dry, that they had run out of gas, and that their connection with God was weakening. 
and a similar percentage of the criers said that they were progressively overrun with activities and activism, producing within them a sense of sorrow, of being out of place in Franciscan religious life. As a consequence, a similar number of respondents said they were concerned by the fact that they felt little emotional attachment to the brothers in the local fraternity, in their province, and the order. Some said they were living on the fumes of the desire and experience of intense prayer that they had experienced before joining the order. The same story of running out of gas and feeling disconnected from the fraternity and from the values of Franciscan life is found also present in the canonical visitations that takes place in all of our different orders. And so, that it, and it touches all walks of life of the friars, stories about being tired, angry, sad, lonely, lone ranger friars who feel that their experience of living in a friary or local community is more like living in Hotel St. Francis, where they have the keys to the door, the meals are provided, that they don't pay at the end of the month, they get something, they get paid for living there, but beyond that, there's no sense of being connected. And then there's another thing that emerged also a concern that the friars expressed, an over focus on self, being in self-maintenance mode, making sure that their world is structured in a way that they are seldom challenged to grow, surrounding themselves with walls and barriers composed of brick and mortar and increasingly of fiber optics and likes. Individualism and an obsession with self-maintenance can lead to distancing from God and from the fraternity and certainly leads us away from the understanding that our life is a journey of conversion. I'd like to, the song came to mind, I, I'm not going to sing it, I, I'd like to sing it, but I won't. Okay, you've heard the, you've probably heard about the uh, Les Miserables, Victor Hugo, it was transferred, it was translated into a, into a, a stage production. The words I dreamed a dream in times gone by when hope was high and life was worth living. I dreamed that love would never die. I dreamed that God would be forgiving. Then I was young and unafraid and dreams were made and youth and wasted. There was no ransom to be paid, no song unsung, no wine untasted, but the tigers come at night with their voices soft as thunder, and they carry your hope apart in your dream. I'd like to conclude with, there's something I was gonna say, something about movement, because the last piece of the gospel Jesus does not stay where he is. Jesus, once he receives his new identity, once he embraces the new way of life of discipleship in the spirit, Jesus then undertakes movement. So there's movement, the movement itself, the conversion, engaging in evangelizing mission is engaging in lifelong conversion. But I'll leave uh, someone tomorrow or the next day to say more about that. I'd like to close with several, four shortcomings of what I've tried to share with you tonight. First, my primary source for my reflections comes from my encounters with brothers in the Friars Minor, OFM, and from the documents that we have generated. It also comes from sharing with some of your minister generals and with minister generals of other religious congregations. Another shortcoming, perhaps, I've chosen an approach through the narration of Jesus' life of the Gospel of St. Mark rather than making a direct appeal to the exciting the documents of our respective order and congregation. I did this because this is where I believe Francis of Assisi began. This is where his rule in life continued. With Jesus and who is present in the gospel, this is what defines and how to define ongoing formation. All other documents of our orders are meant to help serve their commentaries on this essential point of departure the encounter of Jesus in the gospel. The third, I've opted not to include in this presentation issues related to sexual abuse of minors and vulnerable peoples for the simple reason that it merits particular attention that goes well beyond the scope of the time and the nature of the symposium. But I do think that that part of the narrative, the unity of narrative that we are called to live also must include areas in this. I'll leave that for the next completing the next uh, symposium. And I regret, perhaps in some ways, if my ideas and recommendations might not be bold enough to help us move in a direction in the likes of which Pope Francis calls to wake up the world that could actually
actually convince us that in order to be passionate and faithful missionary disciples, we must embrace a way of living the gospel that is forged on the road of daily sharing of life. I believe that we can and we must change the way we think about the formative conversion process. We must promote much greater action on the part of all friars. We can't wait for general chapters or provincial chapters. We can't wait for the provincial and the administration or even our formulas to make new proposals. All of us are on the road. All of us need to be thinking together and creating something new. We need to promote greater dialogue, collective discernment, in order to discover the narrative unity that continues to be present in our lives, individually and collectively, in good times and in bad, even when we have lost our view of that, our vision of that unity. And finally, perhaps when we have done all we can to move ourselves in these directions, placing the crucified Lord Jesus at the center, we will discover, in fact, we already are acting as witnesses of the different way of living, a different way of doing, of acting, of being in Christ Jesus. I still dream a dream. Do you?